This is Bloomberg Crypto, a daily Bloomberg iHeart podcast. And I'm Valdana Hayrek, in today for Stacey Marie Ishmael. It's Thursday, February 2nd. The digital asset industry is reeling from challenges many blame on a handful of so-called crypto bad actors and wayward CEOs. Of course, we're talking about the Do Kwans, the Alex Mashinskys, the Suzus, and of course, the Sam Bankman Freeds. How could we forget? But while some industry leaders say they're upset by the allegedly illegal actions of some of their peers, they still have hope that the digital asset industry will thrive and the crypto market will recover. Mike Novogratz is a prime example. He's the CEO of Galaxy Digital, one of the top investment firms in crypto. The 58-year-old is known for his ubiquitous presence in the crypto sphere and his assertive demeanor, which aligns well with many in the crypto crowd. Novogratz made it through the chaos of 2022, but that does not mean he and his firm were left unscathed. My colleague Shanali Basak recently sat down with him and she joins us now to discuss what's next for him. Shanali, welcome to the show. Hi. So maybe just to lay out for listeners who might not know who Mike Novogratz is, who is he, what's his background, and how has he become this influential figure in the crypto space? So he's a very colorful person on Wall Street, on crypto, in the philanthropy world. I've covered him myself since 2015. He spent time at Goldman Sachs. He was an early member of Fortress, which is a huge private asset firm. And through his time at Fortress, he got into Bitcoin, along with his friend Pete Brigger, who is another Fortress founder. And again, they got in in the early 2010s when it comes to Bitcoin, so made a lot of wealth early on, even after some spectacular hiccups on Wall Street. Novogratz remained a billionaire after having to shut his fund in Fortress uh, that he had really headed up and lost a lot of money at. So this is his third big act. It is uh, a time for redemption. But again, like I said, uh, you know, it's funny when you ask him about kind of his ups and downs on Wall Street, spectacular ups and downs. He says, you know, at the end of the day, he's made more money than lost. He's still a billionaire. And the same is true for the last couple of years in crypto. And crypto is known for giving people maybe second, third, fourth, whatever tries and comebacks. And we'll we'll get to that. But can you tell us a bit more about his background? Who is he? Because he's known for being a wrestler who went to Princeton. I think he was actually roommates with a bunch of other people who are well known on, on Wall Street or in the crypto space. So tell us a bit more about the man himself. He's known for his wrestling background, and it's something that still permeates through a lot of what he does. He makes wrestling anecdotes a lot of time. He grew up in a big family, uh, a military family, and his dad also wrestled. Mike himself was a Princeton wrestler. From what I understand, he was uh, close to winning a state championship as well. So a serious wrestler. He also, you know, his whole family is kind of famous, actually. His uh, sister, Jacqueline Novogratz, is a famous venture capitalist known for impact investing. One of his brothers works at a one of the biggest hedge funds in the world. So the family that kind of grew up with humble roots ended up becoming this pretty famous family in investing. And like I was saying, in philanthropy and even in political circles, he was kind of in a group with Stacey Abrams when it came to knocking door to door in Georgia during some of the most difficult political fights He works closely with the Robin Hood Foundation also, which works to get people out of poverty. So he's very well known, like I said, on Wall Street, but also, you know, just not even just himself coming from this amazingly colorful family. And uh, by the way, it was so funny because in December when I was in his office, one of the things he had on his desk was a New York Post story about his entire family with a post-it note on the New York Post story saying, uh, from his former PR chief, saying thanks for betting on me. So he's kind of had this insane influence on kind of just a lot of people who have worked for him in his life. And even with all the ups and downs of the past, maybe five, six, seven years of his life, he's also well known for wild parties or maybe a sort of like a party boy demeanor. So what's interesting is early, I want to say 2017. So around 2017, remember, he he left Wall Street after his hedge fund at Fortress kind of blew up. They had to shut it down, return money. And he spent a lot of years investing just through his family office. It was this kind of trendy little outfit in like the Soho area of Manhattan. 
And he was investing Bitcoin, making a ton of money off of Bitcoin at that time. This was pre-2017, pre the Mt. Gox blow up. And he realized he was making so much money for it that he should start an investment firm. What he was having, though, was so much of the New York crypto community was coalescing inside of Mike Novogratz's family office. Every single Wednesday night, they would have a party. I used to go almost every Wednesday. Were they fun? They were fun. What was funny about it is Mike was sometimes there, sometimes not. And it reminds me a lot of last year following him around as well, because there were a lot of parties, but it was a stressful year. So Mike was actually outside of those parties on the phone most of the time when I was following him around last year. He's a he's a blast to be around, don't get me wrong. In fact, it was lifestyle choices that it led to his departure at Goldman many, many years ago. It was something that has been widely reported on. But he had a big bar in his office, a little like, you know, one of those kind of bar carts. And I was asking about him. I'm, I'm not fancy enough to know all the fancy liquors. I have them written down somewhere. But he had a ton of fancy liquors. And I asked him, I was like, you know, what is this bar for in your office? And he goes, you know, I don't really drink in the office. My traders do, though. They raid my bar routinely. <laughs> so. That's really funny. Let's go back to the end of 2022, because that's when you were meeting with him. So what was going on in crypto? What was the mood like when you were sitting down with him at his office? Like, what were the things that were top of mind for him? What did he want to talk about? Well, one of the first things I said as I sat down to him was this is probably one of the hardest stories I'm going to write with you because we haven't had a market this choppy in a long time. I think that there's a lot of soul searching about his place, about Galaxy's place in this industry as so much of a shakeout is happening. He sat back with his arms crossed He's interesting in how he answers questions when he's not on TV because he waits a second and he thinks. He scratches his head and then he tells you what he thinks. And he's pretty, again, for journalists, it's a bit of a journalist dream because he tells you where he thinks he could have done something differently. And I think something that was important and interesting, we're talking about Luna, we're talking about Do Kwan, they weren't invested in all parts of the empire. But I asked him, I was like, would you do anything different when it came to your exposure to Luna and Do Kwan? And he goes, I only met Do twice. And he goes, I've got to say, now I would want to meet people much more than that. I would want to have them maybe work out of my office. I would have them lunches, dinners, coffees. He's like, I, he's like, I already do that a lot. But he goes, knowing somebody more is a big lesson coming out of 22. So it was a very big lessons learned kind of moment at the end of last year. Right. And in your story, you say that he actually had somebody warn him about SBF and FTX. Yeah, I would die to know who because interestingly do you guys remember so there was a friday that that bankruptcy filing was filed yep F the ftx one the ftx bankruptcy so remember so mike told me that they actually passed on the ability to invest in ftx on the venture round i asked why was it due diligence he goes it's actually just a matter of valuation we thought it was too expensive they passed on the venture round but it was one of many counterparties for them in the scope of digital, Galaxy Digital, it's not a ton of exposure, but they did lose $77 million. So his friend called him on Monday morning. This is the weekend, like the Monday after that weekend, if you remember, uh, CZ over at Binance was tweeting about selling his FTT tokens and Sam Bankman fried was tweeting about their own kind of financial health before everything crashed. So the Monday morning, Mike Novogratz got a call, gets a call from one of his billionaire friends who got a call from Sam. Sam, at that point, was looking for money. And it was becoming clear that there was a large hole in FTX's balance sheet. That's when Mike started selling and reducing his exposure dramatically. Remember, the, the one thing, and again, like I said, this is really a, a make or break moment for Mike. But the one thing he has in the benefit of hindsight that a lot of people don't have in crypto, especially if you're, say, 30 years old, like Sam Bankman fried the what it's like to have lost money in the past is an important lesson in risk management. There's a lot of people who trust Mike because of how much money he's lost. So he started selling, selling, selling. They got it out until the exposure was just $77 million. And yeah, that that was that. And, you know, I think that's an important kind of aspect of markets, this intimacy that people have and what's going on and how they find information. I think whether you're Mike or anybody, I think access to information in the crypto community you know, it doesn't work the same way as it does in other financial markets sometimes. I can't believe we've gone this far without mentioning the headline of your story, which is maybe one of the most provocative headlines I've ever seen, at least for Bloomberg. So it's Mike Novogratz wants to punch disgraced crypto titans in the face. Tell us who, who he's angry with. 
Yeah, you know, it's funny. An earlier version of this story, my first line was Mike Novogratz is frustrated. Because I asked him, I was trying to get a sense of his mindset and frustrated is the best possible way to put it. And, you know, the two people he wanted to punch in the face were Barry Silbert, and uh, who is the digital currency group head, whose co- a unit of Genesis Capital is now going under a bankruptcy process, and uh, Sam Bankman fried You know, you think about last year, the whole thing started with Luna, Three Arrows, but things exacerbated so dramatically with Three Arrows leading to more issues over at Genesis and then concerns about DCG and Barry Silbert's handling of the whole situation and Sam Bankman fried of course, and, and FTX's exposure and how that got wilder after the Luna collapse as well. And so the anger was very, very, very much directed less at Doe and more at Barry and Sam Bankman fried Want to punch them in the face. This is where I say, you know, as a reporter, you're sitting here, we ask the questions, right? So it's kind of like, I can never do what Mike's personality is like, justice, right? But, uh, you know, we started this conversation talking about how he's a wrestler. And the last line of the story kind of talks about how, you know, he's gearing up for his next big fight. He's going to fight the institutions and the regulators and, and just really win back trust in this industry. Yeah. Listen, the rest of this this malarkey that we've had with between three arrows and and, you know, BlockFi and Celsius and all these companies that were either poorly run or fraudulently run uh, certainly is hurting the overall confidence in crypto. Right. But this too shall pass. They will be brushed off into the dustbin of history. Yeah. And. The industry itself is going to emerge having learned lessons stronger yeah. and you're going to see the, the price take back off. Which is why his place in this industry is so important. Yes, he's lost some money, but I talked to some of his billionaire friends as well who are maybe exposed to crypto or maybe thinking about being exposed to crypto. One of the most important ones was Stan Druckenmiller, legendary investor who worked for George Soros, now uh, invests on his own at Duquesne. And I asked Dan, I was like, would you give Mike money after all this? And he said, yeah, he'd consider it. I mean, that's the thing that's interesting about all this. Mike, depending on who you are, uh, depending on all the losses at Galaxy, even the stock. Remember, Mike's own wealth, he lost more than $3 billion on paper. And a lot of that was Galaxy's stock decline. So now it's a question of, how is he going to raise money again and really get back to being on? I mean, he is. On, I mean, they're well in this industry. Let's be very clear about this. How is he going to win back trust, not just for Galaxy, but for the industry after what happened last year? And I think that that's the, the pivotal question as Galaxy reorganizes, by the way. Remember, they laid off almost 15 percent of their staff last year. But in a television interview, he told me that he actually thinks Headcount is going to get back to above where they cut because now they're buying the assets out of bankruptcy. So he's trying to play offense. And I think that this will be a really interesting year. Coming up, more with Bloomberg reporter Shanali Basak on how one of the industry's top CEOs is still pretty bullish on crypto. We'll be right back. At the same time, you have this uh, paragraph in the story. It says, time is short, galaxy, Novogratz tells you, can withstand 18 more months of this pain. For years, he's doubtful that his employees would be able to roll with it for that long. For somebody, so like I said, I've covered him since 2015. There's another little story I'll give you about 2017 after this. But, you know, give I... Give it now. Give it now. Uh, well, well <laughs> let me answer the question first, because I think that this is a critical part of the story. Because at the beginning, I said this was a matter of Mike's reputation. And to the extent crypto is kind of, you know, I, Mike Novogratz like a cat. Like, the guy's got nine lives and he makes it through, right? But, you know, and Wall Street works that way, you know? But 18 months feels like there's a clock that's ticking a little bit. He doesn't say he's going to throw in the towel. He doesn't go that far. But he does say it'll be hard to keep him employee morale high. Like, it, it's harder. It gets really harder after 18 months to go through a market slump. Now, back to 2017, when he first planned to start investing other people's money into crypto after making a lot of money on his own. He had a plan to start a hedge fund, and we wrote about it here at Bloomberg. My colleague Eric Shatsky wrote about it. Very soon, within, like, immediately, he decided he's not doing that anymore because the market conditions were bad. The market was crashing. So Mike, again, even in Bitcoin, has been through historic ups and downs. The last crash, 2017-2018, Mt. Gox era, lost a lot of money, hundreds of millions of dollars, I'm told. And then he turns around and goes bigger. He goes, I am not going to do a hedge fund. 
I'm going to build a merchant bank. I'm going to build something that's going to become the Goldman Sachs of crypto. Can you imagine losing hundreds of millions of dollars, having a plan to do something, yeah, I do, I scrapping do on that plan, basis. and then having a bigger plan the next day, which, by the way, he's then taken public on the Canadian stock exchange. He's trying to take it public in the United States. There's still a lot of concerns that the SEC has about crypto in general. But if he gets listed in the U.S. To this year, what a, what a coup after all that, if you think about it. And especially when you think back to that initial story where the ambitions were just to have a crypto hedge fund. No, he wants to build a crypto empire. And as he restructures, uh, one thing that's interesting that's happening is they're kind of merging different units, venture and asset management units, and it's very possible that they go back to market and raise money from third-party investors again. And that kind of dream about being like, he's used a few different anecdotes, a Goldman of crypto or a Berkshire Hathaway of crypto to kind of invest in all of those fledgling companies. I think it's the venture part of it is harder to get a handle of because it's not like buying a token that goes up and down and you see how it does in a year. A venture investment often takes multiple years before you see how it actually does in the end. So to end on a more positive note. So it's crypto, as we mentioned, is known for its second and third and fourth comebacks, comeback stories. We even have some recently in the we've had some headlines of um, maybe we can call them disgraced crypto people who are trying to make a comeback still. So can you just talk about that aspect and what it is about crypto itself where there's this sort of never ending prospect of hope? Isn't this what makes it so fun to cover? I think it's the multifaceted angles. If you think about all the reasons um, crypto failed last year, a lot of it was risk management. A lot of it was Think about all of the way these companies were structured with the intercompany loans and the double, triple, quadruple bailouts, <laughs> throwing a lot of bad money after good. Think about what Mike did in that time. He sold. He largely sold. And again, he's buying now, but we're, it's also become a better year already for something like Bitcoin. When I talked to his other investors as well, the reality for them, which is fascinating, is that they like a lot of people out there, believe Bitcoin itself hadn't failed. In the middle of all of that, in the middle of what people were worried about being a systemic crash, never happened. <laughs> Even the genesis matter now, so far, is fairly contained. Could get worse, could always get worse. But at the end of the day, you know, there are a number of very influential people in finance, let alone crypto, who have become more sold on the story after last year, more compelled to buy assets now that they're cheaper, right? More than a fourth cheaper than they were at their peak. So it'll. this is such a pivotal year because do people buy the story of Bitcoin or crypto? You were saying uh, college, uh, college friends, Joe Lubin, uh, is friends with Mike. He went to Princeton with Mike. Um, Dan Moorhead over at um, Pantera, friend of Mike. So you, you, let's see how these folks navigate through. They have made it largely away from a lot of those big disgraces, as you've been talking about. But can they win back the hearts and minds of the people that are putting money behind this industry? We'll see. Uh, thank you, guys. This is fun. Bye, Shanali. Bye. That was Bloomberg reporter Shanali Basak. You can find more of her work on the Bloomberg Terminal and on Bloomberg.com. For more, be sure to check out our twice-weekly newsletter, Bloomberg Crypto. This is Bloomberg Crypto, a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Send us your comments, questions, or suggestions for the show to crypto at Bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of Bloomberg Crypto is Vicky Vergolina. Our senior producer is Janet Babin. Our producers are Mohamed Farouk and Sharon Bariro. Our associate producers are Ty Butler and Moses Undam. Desta Wonderad is our engineer. Original music by Leo Sidron. I'm Stacey Marie Ishmael. We'll be back tomorrow. 